Welcome to worship this morning on the second Sunday of Advent. I want to thank you for your faithful giving. If you are on to the online giving options here at Swamp, I encourage you to let us know that you do no longer need the offering envelopes. Call Brenda in the office so we can take you off that mailing list. Next Sunday is a congregational meeting. So there'll be one service here at Swamp at 830, followed by the congregational meeting at 930. I want to draw your attention to the various things in the bulletin. Uh, the activities for the coming week, our handbell choir is doing some interesting things. We also have our night of music coming up. Uh, so I want to encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities, and we'll see you right here. And now we prepare for worship. With our first hymn, Prepare the Royal Highway, hymn number 264. Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son, by his coming give to the pe all the people of the world knowledge of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Malachi, the third chapter. God announces a covenant with Israel, a messenger like Malachi, his name means messenger, will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord by purifying and refining God's people as silver and gold are refined. The text speaks, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Second reading is from Philippians, the first chapter. The Apostle Paul was the pastor of many new churches. He writes in this letter about his joy to be in partnership with the Christians of Philippi. Listen to how tender-hearted Paul, sometimes a stern preacher, is with his friends as he encourages them to grow in love and knowledge. St. Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, 
so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced a harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory, glory to, to you, O Lord. John the Baptist is a herald of Jesus, whose way is prepared by repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As we hear the careful record of human leaders, we sense the spectrum of political and religious authority that will be challenged by this coming Lord. The Gospel speaks. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you. O Christ. Will you please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and suitable in your sight, O God, our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness reminds me of hunting. My family's cabin is in Juniata County, and I don't get out there much anymore, particularly with this new uh, assignment. But I recall in my hunting days, with me perched in my tree stand, sometimes the weather was pleasant, sometimes not, but it was always a peaceful time. Because amongst the moments of running squirrels and the occasional cautious deer would be long spells of silence. And in that silence, I did a lot of thinking, reflecting, nodding off, and yes, shivering. And I too, in the midst of my nodding off, would hear a voice crying in the wilderness. Of course, it was other hunters putting on a drive further up the hill, and the voice I heard was them hollering to scare deer onto waiting hunters. But seriously, for me, these memories have a romantic sentimentality. And I think for most of us, we romanticize the wilderness. We think of the wilderness as a place of natural beauty and holistic balance. But that's not the way the Bible presents the wilderness. It is portrayed as a barren, dangerous place where any number of deprivations or injury could befall a person. It's portrayed as inhospitable. And it is placed in sharp contrast to the Garden of Eden. And having this understanding of wilderness is important for us to make sense of our text today. We must remember that the Bible itself is a wilderness text. By this I mean it is a text born of trauma, displacement, and loss. The authors were not, by and large, history's winners. Rather, they were the dislocated, the enslaved, persecuted. They endured natural disaster, plague, famine, and war. They suffered genocide, starvation, barrenness, exile, captivity, and colonization. They cried out, literally, and metaphorically in the wilderness, in the desert, where there is no safety net. A place that's risky and raw, where illusions of self-sufficiency are shattered. And they cried out their sorrow, their rage, their horror, and yes, their pain. But they also cried out their hope. Hope in a God who cares and loves. Hope in a God who vindicates and restores hope in a God who saves. It's a hope upon hope in a God who provides grace upon grace. And it is today in our text that we're invited into the desolate wilderness to listen to the voice of one proclaiming a robust hope in the truth of God's faithfulness. It begins with Luke 
placing the story in the 15th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius. Now, if Luke simply intended to give a time in history, he could have stopped with Tiberius, but he doesn't stop there. He names six more leaders. In all, he names five political leaders and two religious leaders. Why? Why did he do this? Well, I think it was to contrast the power with the powerless, the somebodies with the nobody. You see, Luke names seven centers of authority, both political and religious, seven very important people holding very important positions. But God's word doesn't come to any of them. No, the story of God's incarnation comes elsewhere. That is, the word of God does not come to the elites in their palaces or temple. Instead, it comes to the son of a small town. Small time has been synagogue priest and his erstwhile barren wife. And it comes to him while he is in the wilderness, wearing animal skins and eating locusts to survive. That is, God's word comes to the nobody who is nowhere, off the beaten path, far from the halls of power. Indeed, the word of God comes to John, the one who gives up his hereditary claim to the clout and comfort of priesthood for the privations and humiliations of the desert wilderness. Now, when thinking about wilderness in the biblical sense, I'm drawn to the fact that the wilderness moments in our lives expose our need for God. I mean, it is when we are at our lowest, in our wilderness, that we can best hear and feel God in our lives. When things are going well and we're riding high, our perceived need for God is diminished. And that is sin. When we are lulled into a false sense of self-sufficiency that separates us from God. And so whether imposed on us or the result of our own poor decisions, our wilderness moments are opportunities to get back on track with God. And that is just a message that Luke attributes to John who proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And then Luke quotes the words of the prophet Isaiah to suggest that the repentance of his listeners is how John would prepare the way of the Lord. And when we do, the mountains and valleys exist on the same plane. Crooked paths are made straight, rough ways made smooth. It's a metaphorical, it is a metaphorical image of things being made right, being made whole. And during the season of Advent, a time of waiting, preparing for the coming of Jesus, this text reminds us not to get lulled into a state of comfortable complacency. This text, and next week's too, remind us that the way to the manger goes through John, and John is all about a repentance and the forgiveness of sins that follows it. Now the Greek word for repent is metanoia. It does not mean a mere regret for past misdeeds. Rather, it means a change of mind, a change of heart, to change direction. Metanoia is the root word for metamorphosis, where one thing changes into another. Repentance, then, is an inner transformation that bears fruit, as John will dwell on next week. As for us this week, well, Luke suggests the wilderness is a place where we can see the entire landscape whole and participate in God's great leveling work. It's a call to an honest, wilderness-style reckoning with sin. And we can begin by embracing that we fall terribly short of God's goals for us. We can stop pretending that we're perfect and, and not in need of God's help. We can stop denying the truth that we do struggle, stumble, and screw up. In a nutshell, we are invited to embrace the reality that we are fallible, prone to wander, and incapable of living a perfect life. But, and this is the most important thing to remember, we can and should drop our baggage at the door and fall with abandon into the forgiving arms of a God who loves us unconditionally. Not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. We belong to God. And because of that, we can cling to the hope and promise of our biblical ancestors, hopeful for restoration, 
hopeful for abundant and overflowing grace, hopeful for rescue and salvation. In short, John challenges us to leave our spots of privilege, to feel the rough, rough places beneath the feet, to experience the struggle down crooked paths, to glimpse the arrogance of the mountains and the desolation of the valleys, to dream God's dream of a wholly reimagined landscape where the valleys of death are filled and the mountains of oppression are flattened. A landscape so smooth and straight that all flesh will see the salvation of God. Folks, it is my fervent hope and prayer that God's word would come to us just like it did to John and transform our hearts and transform us into messages of hope in desolate places and thus preparing the way of the Lord. And that, my friends, is the good news in Christ Jesus for us today. And so now may the peace that surpasses all our understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. You send messages in the world to proclaim the day of your coming. Make our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay preachers confident in their preaching, that their words in our lives witness to your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. Send your spirit to all living creatures that are endangered. Provide them with shelter and care, and bring us into right relationship with the earth that you create and call good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Send leaders to our nation, city, schools, and businesses to work on behalf of those who have lost parents, spouses, and loved ones. Immigrants, the imprisoned, those living in poverty, and all who are oppressed. Make them bold in their commitments to justice and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Send your servants to care for those who suffer. Use our ministries and our lives to reach out with compassion to those who are hungry, oppressed, lonely, or ill. This day we lift up to you those on our prayer list and all those we name before you now, either aloud on our lips and silently in our hearts. Grant them healing and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Send prophets to speak difficult truths, even when they are poorly received. Embolden those who ask hard questions and challenge accepted ways. Instill in youth and elders alike a passion for pointing to Jesus in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We remember your saints, both those publicly celebrated and those more humbly remembered. Confident that your work will be completed, we live in faith until the day of your coming. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your, your will, will be done, be done on earth, earth as in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us, us our, our sins. sins. As we, we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now receive God's blessing. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus for whom we wait. Amen. Amen. And now we will conclude by singing our closing prayer on Jordan's Banks, the Baptist Cry.
Now go in peace. Christ is near. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.